Um, so yeah, so my name is uh, my name is Chris Kinch. I'm um, part of the front end development team uh, over at Dennis. Um, just going to give you a run through of what we did with Responsive. So um, we by no means saying that this is the best way to do it. We by no means saying that we're we're the pros. We just think we're pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, we just sort of give you a bit of an overview of you know how what what problems we faced and, and what we did to solve them and you know where we know we have our faults where we know we want to improve. Um, and, you know, if anyone has any better ideas, I'm sort of very open to to have a chat with you about it. Um, So yeah, I mean, we'll start with uh, what is what is responsive. Um, so this is the definition I grabbed off of uh, Google. Um, so responsive web design, or really responsive web design, is uh, an approach aimed at uh, crafting sites to provide an optimal view of experience, um, easy reading, and navigation, with a minimum number of resizes, panning, scrolling across a wide range of visitor devices. Um, so that's nice and simple, right? So. The media queries, we can all go to the pub. Any questions we have? <laughs> yeah. But um, in reality, we, we sort of had to ask ourselves, well, what does it actually mean to, to Dennis? Uh, what, what are we trying to capture? So I tried to break it down into the four or four main important pillars um, to us. So the first one uh, Chris has touched upon, which is done and get units. Um, you know, we need to be able to load them when we need them and very importantly, not load them, or we don't need them. Um, before, our only solution was to hide an ad slot once the ad is already loaded, and of course this is, this is very bad, and quite illegal I'm pretty sure in some, some circumstances. Um, so I'll, I'll, touch on, I'll touch on that bit in, in, in a bit. Um, had to be device uh, agnostic, uh, this, is, this is kind of the, the obvious one, um, covered in the definition. Um, had to be lightweight. You know, we're talking about a range of devices here, mobiles, old and new. Um, and it had to be mobile first. I mean, it had to be designed with, with mobile in mind. Um, so before I start, I'll tell you a little story of how we got into uh, responsive. Um, we had lessons from Microsoft. Um, Microsoft came along to Dennis about two and a half years ago now. Um, and they asked us to make them a microsite. Uh, it was Microsoft uh, about Windows 8. Um, so obviously it had to be very responsive, had to be you know, great on mobile devices, it's a big push for Windows 8. Um, they gave us loads of money. Um, and we got to experiment with responsive. We got to um, do a lot of dev work there. It was money up front, we could, we could kind of, you know, we had to get the job done. Um, so we used that time to have a play around, to, to experiment. Um, we got a minimum viable product, Microsoft very happy, we learned all of our lessons, great. Now let's take this, take this technology and let's apply it to our sites. The one big problem was still that these microsites didn't require any ads. The whole thing was an ad, so the problem was, what do we do? What do we do about the ads? And unfortunately, don't mess with it, but the ads pay the bills. You know, we have an advertising model, um, it's how we generate revenue. Um, so that was the first place we looked. GPT has come along, very promising, some great, some great new tools in there. So we started to look at what can we use it for. One of the most important things was we need the ads to load in a particular viewport. So this disable initial load uh, function, which we touched on, um, is what facilitates that. When a page loads, we can say, don't load any of the ads. Then, when we're ready, when we know the width of the site, now load the ads that I have specified. Um, that whole system needed a high level of customization. We needed to be able to say, on one site, load this set of ads on this viewport. On another site, load this set of ads. On this site, I want to load an ad when I change the orientation. So we needed a we needed a way to sort of have a high level of granular customization. Um, and on the same kind of note, we wanted the ads to load quickly, load early. Um, we wanted them to be able to load from anywhere. You know, we, we might have one on a pullback from a function from another script. We might have 
another one that's you know in a on a timer or something like that. You know, there are lots of different situations where we we might want to, to load a different app, um, and it had to be asynchronous because that was one of the the big benefits of uh, GPT, and we didn't want to lose that. Um, so that was the kind of ad <laughs> section. Um, Quite a lot of stuff to go through here, so if I'm, if I'm rushing, feel free to call out any questions or ask me class. But um, so that was your ad section. Um, then we move on to um, the big device uh, agnostic. Um, so this is a, an image. I saw some people chuckle as it came up. I think some of you have seen it before. Um, this image blew me away when I first saw it the first time. I couldn't believe it was actually real. I had to actually Google some of the different devices in there. Um, but this is all of the different devices that Samsung produced, and I think this is about a year old now. Um, so, obviously, there's a huge range there. There's no way we can design sites for distinct breakpoints anymore. It has to be a fluid experience from device to device. Um, so, how do, we, how do we achieve that bit? Sorry, right, we, we started some with SaaS. So before, we were using um, less, uh, less in SaaS and a lot of similarities. Um, for anyone that doesn't know or hasn't, hasn't used either, um, they're very similar, but SAS seems to have a lot more um, below the surface functionality. It has a lot more, it's, it's, a, it's very robust. Um, so we started to take a look at, at SAS, and some of the major benefits that we came across were shared partials. So partials are um, chunks of code that you can load from different SAS files. Um, and we found a way with SAS to load partials from our base theme into our sub themes for our individual sites. So that allows us to do things like set up a bunch of variables, a bunch of default things that we know we use on the majority of our sites, even down to things like layouts in our base theme, whilst in our sub themes, we can very easily override those. Those variables can be tweaked. Those variables will be things like how wide is your tablet record? Maybe we want to tweak that on the site. Maybe things like whole media queries can be rewritten for a particular site. We can also override an entire CSS file or SAS file um, from the subtheme. So this allows us to do um, some very cool things um, with the SAS, with CSS. Um, one of those cool things being using grids entirely in CSS. So before we were coming from the, the world of you know, 960 grid, we used a lot having your classes in your markup. Um, one of the big switches for us was switching to a completely CSS based grid system. So Zen Grids is something that plugs in by a compass um, and allows you to do all kinds of layout things in media queries very, very simply, very, very quickly. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. And there are lots of different grid systems. Um, this is just the particular one that we ended up using. <coughs> so then so moving on to the lightweight aspect. Um, we needed to clean up our theme. We had a base, a base theme. We were now thinking, right, we, we need a second base theme. We need a, a 2.0. We need our responsive one. Our old base theme was full of excess code, too many divs, um, you know, bloated CSS. It become unwieldy. You know, we have something like 34, 35 different sites. So we need to clean that up. So the first thing we took a look at was template files, uh, reducing simplification, um, reducing uh, markup, trying to make it a bit more customizable. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the theme Mothership, but uh, it's uh, a Drupal theme uh, designed by uh, Morton DK, and he um, is a complete hound when it comes to clean, usable markup. So we wanted to get a bit of that in, but not lose any of the, customiz the, the customizability of it. Um, we looked at images. Um, we looked at uh, reducing the amount of images. Obviously, we're talking about mobile devices here. We want to load as little as possible, data-wise. So we, we converted a lot of things to font icons. We converted a lot of uh, things we might have had a gradient background image to uh, CSS background image. Again, SAS is great for this. It has very clean fullbacks built in. Um, also using things like beta URIs and, and uh, SVGs and things. Um, threw a lot of toggles into the info file to be able to switch pieces of functionality on and off. 
So for a particular site, you might have a small menu. You don't want a full snap menu inside. You can turn that off. Things like that. And then aggregation of CSS. Again, SAS, Compass is great at pulling all your CSS together, um, compiling it and minifying it, and making sure it's, it's as small as it so we can be. So then we move on to mobile first, which is the last pillar. Um, so I added this slide in uh, originally without a little caveat, um, and it was my controversial slide, it's the one I wanted to turn heads with. Um, but I couldn't do it, I had to put the little caveat in. Um, so it, it, what do I mean, iterative development hates mobile first? Um, iterative development is great. Um, it's great for making small gains, uh, very safe gains. Um, but when we're going mobile first, when we're going for a full responsive redesign, um, it doesn't work so well. And that's because of this thing called the local maximum problem. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, I'm not familiar with the term, iterative development. So uh, it kind of is the philosophy of like, uh, we've heard of agile development. Okay. Is that, so it's, yeah, the philosophy of um, making small changes, releasing quickly, um, measuring the success, doing that, that test. If, it, if it's a good success, you know, good things like split testing and stuff like that. So success, okay, a bit more in that direction, because that's not so much of a success, maybe go back a bit and go in a different direction. But it's the sort of small gains that you, you strive for. Um, and then the problem with this is that you end up climbing a foothill. So you're making small gains, small gains, but you're in a certain realm, you're in a certain place, and eventually you'll get to the top of that foothill, and then you have nowhere to go. Whereas really, you could be climbing that mountain over there. But in order to get over there, you have to take a big leap. You have to change everything up. Now that's not to say you just take a leap of faith and just do it, um, which is what we did on the first side of the redesign, which was men's fitness. On the second side we redesigned, which has been Carla, not quite released yet, we've taken a bit of a different approach. And that approach is, to test your users on a beta version of the site. So these are the kind of things that you can do to take a huge leap, maybe completely redesign the look of the site or completely mobile first, whilst at the same time, maybe only putting 10% of your users in that beta camp. And then you can do your tests, you can check that they like it, make your changes. Once you then do your switch over to your new site, once that new site is at least as good as your old site, then you go back into your iterative development process and you work your way up to the top of that mountain. So, those are the kind of the four big pillars that we, we tried to cover. Um, so I thought I'd just try to give a bit of a summary, a bit of a what, what is in our Lego box of, of toys for responsive. So we have Compass, we have SAS, uh, kind of go hand in hand. We've got media queries, good old fashioned media queries. Same grids. Uh, they work with the media queries, and again, it's a SAS thing. Um, dynamic GPT, this is the, the thing that we, we call our script to load ads when they need to be loaded. Um, Enquire.js, uh, this is the way we tell JavaScript how to load the media queries so that it's in sync with the CSS media queries. Um, Modernizer, for doing any, any kind of testing we need to do, checking if media queries are even available or not, if we need to load polyfills for certain things, um, perhaps we need to load a certain script just for tablet or something like that. Um, Snap.js, which is uh, another little library we use for our menus. When we go down to mobile, we have a little pop-out menu, a bit like an app. Um, Savior.js, this is what we use when we need to do a masonry style layout, columns and blocks and kind of <coughs> Tab, tab design and things like that. Uh, we used to do Salvatore, we used to do Masonry before that. We've gone through many a hard, hard uh, afternoon trying to figure out these things and how they work. And then the breakpoints module, which is uh, how we tell uh, Drupal, how we tell PHP to uh, conform with the same breakpoints as we're using for the JavaScript and for the, uh, the CSS. So that's quite a list already. Um, when I saw first going to responsive design, I was like, media queries, no problem, let's go. But that's quite a list already, but there's more. Um, so these are things that we're either currently working on or we really want to implement. So you know, there's still lots of stuff for us to, to work through. 
JS aggregation, as I said, this is a big focus for us at the moment. Um, that comes into uh, require JS, which is what will hopefully solve some of the JS uh, aggregation problems for us. Uh, and it will also replace modernizer, so it will uh, resolve some of the dependencies, the asynchronous loading and the testing for certain um, device capabilities. Um, we developed a thing called uh, Block Hopper, uh, so Drupal module and a JavaScript library that lets you do things like uh, have a block in a prominent place on mobile, for example, but then you don't want it there when you get up to the tablet, you want to maybe move it into uh, a sidebar or down in by your content or something like that. Um, so this is a nice little JavaScript module that lets you configure your breakpoints and then have things jump around the page as you go through uh, different, uh, to different viewport sizes. Um, lazy loading, not just of, of images, but also lazy loading things like your uh, comments at the bottom of the page, or uh, maybe your ads, maybe you only load the page with two ads and then as you scroll down you get a third, a fourth, and a fifth. Um, all these kind of things are going to help massively for the weight of the page um, for a mobile user. Uh, UI UX improvements, always on the cards, always sort of iterating and, and improving as, as things go. Um, and then also leveraging device capabilities. Um, I've seen one site which had this very cool functionality where when you want to uh, use the regular search on the site, if you're on a mobile device, you can tap it and then just speak and away you go. Um, so these cool little uh, additions that you know, you know sort of um, yeah leverage the, the device capabilities of uh, modern devices. Oh yeah, and also so I'm trying to put in some funding for a death rate. So <laughs> that will uh, go through. So that's kind of the overview. We redid really Men's Fitness. Um, we picked Men's Fitness because it had a great mix, a great mix of. Um, enough traffic to make it a meaningful meaningful test, a meaningful you know, view of did we do this right. But at the same time, it was uh, commercially viable, so it, it wasn't the top of the, the risk ladder, I should say. Um, the first thing I will say about going responsive on men's fitness is we should not have done it over Christmas. It <laughs> works out over Christmas. So, I'll hold some stats for everyone. This is the uh, <coughs> where we get very re revealing for you, full front on it. Um, so, I don't know if yeah, everyone can read that, but um, some of the sort of overview bits. We got sessions up, great, new users up, great. This is a comparison of September to March. Uh, I've tried to space it out a little bit. I think when I originally did this, I, I did December to January, and it was something like a 250% increase in traffic for those months or something crazy like that because everyone wants to work out in January. Um, but this has calmed down a little bit. So we look at things like bounce rate. It's got a little bit worse. Okay, we we'll kind of deal with that. We'll have to try and find out what that is. Pages per session though, it's gone up, great. Average session duration also gone up, great. But then when we break it down to mobile and tablet, those ones actually gone down slightly in desktop has gone up. But then page per session has gone up slightly, so that's okay. So I looked at these and I thought, well, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at here. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to compare this to something. Um, so I compared it to women's fitness. Um, it's, great. it's a great one to compare it to, similar kind of audience, but presumably more female. Um, same design. So we deliberately have the two brands aligned design-wise, except one is got a pinky view, the other one has a reddish view. Um, but most importantly, Women's Fitness had not got undergone in it, uh, under, uh, not been uh, redesigned in any kind of way, hadn't had any kind of um, responsive work done to it. So great, so I looked at these figures, and page per session has gone down slightly. Average session duration has gone down, and so has bounce rate, most importantly. So bounce rate, we're expecting, okay, maybe that just does go down slightly when we jump from the end of one year to the beginning of another. But all of these figures, they're not very what we were expecting. We were expecting a huge increase in uh, pages per session, for example. Um, we were expecting a, a, a massive increase in um, average session duration, for example. 
But at the same time, maybe we won't. Maybe if a user gets to the site, gets their content really fast because we've arranged it all beautifully, maybe they're at a bus stop and they read that content really quickly where they wouldn't have visited the site before, and then they leave, maybe that's why the bounce rate's higher. Maybe that's why you might expect the page duration to be slightly lower than pages per visit to be higher. What we learned out of all this was that we hadn't really learned anything. But this was part of the reason for doing it on Lens Fitness. This was part of the reason why, when we then moved on to the next site that we are designing responsibly, we have gone with a much more cautious approach. And this is why we now developed the tech to have a beta site, beta environment, and do split tests and things like that. So really, you can say that doing this on Lens Fitness first was invaluable in that it taught us that it's not just an easy win to go responsible. Do you test your designs in kind of closed sessions before you before you start developing, or do you make stuff and then test it in a while in, in like small percentage pieces? Uh, good question. When we uh, sorry, the question was so do we um, take our designs and do some sort of smaller group user testing first before actually going into the wild with the site? Yeah. Um, for our regular sites, yes, we did. For men's fitness, uh, we did. Men's fitness was. Um, sort of from the beginning, very much a uh, let's let's try this. With the end goal being, we don't want to completely mess this <coughs> up. Um, with car buyer, we've been a lot more cautious. We're going to be putting a certain percentage of people in. They can then opt out. Um, but I definitely think it will be something that we should do going forward. Yeah. So. That was, our, that was our case study. Um, that was our uh, real life case study. So I just wanted to close with something cool and witty and I couldn't think of anything, so uh, left this slide in in the end. Um, what, I did, what I did actually come up with, um, I've got here, is that um, the web is our medium and responsive is our toolbox. toolbox. But I thought that was, a bit, that was a bit too hippie for me, I didn't like that. Um, there was a story I heard about uh, Facebook uh, a Facebook redesign of the um, the news feed, and apparently it was too good. People were no longer browsing different uh, sections of the site. They were just sticking to their news feed because it was perfect and it had everything they needed and it looked fantastic. So they scrapped it and they went back to something that looked a little bit uglier. Um, and apparently there was a guy in a bar somewhere who worked at Facebook who was overheard saying, uh, "Whatever goes up I mean, like in the numbers." That's what we'll build. But then it turned out that story wasn't true. So I'll scrap that. Um, what I ended up with was um, I was complaining that I couldn't think of anything cool. And a guy I worked with said, Well, if we don't do it, someone else will. I said, Actually, that's, that's exactly the way I feel about it. Is that we have to think about users, we have to think about our revenue. And at the end of the day, we want to strike a balance between them. That's the key. We want to have a site that is better for the user, better to browse, easier to, to navigate around on mobile and tablet and everything. And we want them to visit the site more often. That's how we get our advertising revenue. If we don't do that, with people talking about stats like 50% of their users are on mobile devices, somebody else is going to do that in a way that pleases their users. So we just have to try and find a good way to do it first. Um, and that's what we've been trying to do. So, thank you for listening to me.